Two years ago, my next guest was so overweight that the chairs she sat in broke. She couldn't fit into airplane seats and had difficulty going to the toilet and wasn't able to walk properly at just five feet foot and weighing 23 stone. She was told her life was in danger and realized she had to do something about it. She has since lost 12 stone and has gone from being practically immobile to climbing Mount Everest. And she also managed to find love on Facebook along the way. Would you welcome, please, Tina Gates. Welcome. Thank you very Good much. Good to see you, looking so well. Oh. You got to 23 stone. Yeah. Um, how does one become so overweight? Well, I didn't realize that it was happening. Um, I think it started, I, I think most people that I've spoken to yeah. have, you know, a problem with overweight. Normally there's something that, that sparks it or happens. To me, it was, I had a horse riding accident and I stopped being active. Um, but I still ate the same amount of food that I was eating while I was an active person. And it was yeah. a very slow, gradual process. And then one day I looked in the mirror and I realised that I was overweight. And, and what, like, what, what were you eating to get there? Yeah. I mean, how, how, how bad did it get? What were, you, what were you doing? Well, it wasn't that my eating habits had changed. Yeah. It was the fact that I wasn't doing as much exercise as I was when I was eating originally that diet. Yeah. And the food that I was eating wasn't really that terribly bad. But my lifestyle was really bad in that um, I worked the early morning shift in local radio station, 98 FM. Yeah. Um, and I got up at 4 o'clock in the morning, went to work. Um, didn't feel like eating at that hour of the morning. Sure. Uh, survived on coffee for most of the, the morning. Um, didn't eat really at lunchtime. Was caught up in the adrenaline, and, and you know from the TV business, you're working in the media, you're rushing, you're racing, mm -hmm. um, you're tearing around the place, you're drinking coffee, and you're not really thinking about food. Yeah. And then it all comes to an end at the end of your working day, and you go home, and I would feel absolutely wrecked and tired and exhausted, and I wouldn't be interested in cooking. And I go and I'd open the fridge, I'd have the first easy thing that I could see, which was usually processed or something that was high in fat, and mm. I'd sit down and 15 minutes later I'd be hungry again and I'd go again. So I'd basically graze from about maybe 4 o'clock in the afternoon until the time I went to bed. And we're eating rubbish. I was, uh, it wasn't even so much rubbish, but it was high fat food, yes. and it was processed food, and it was quick food. Okay. Um, and I didn't have the energy to go out and shop. And I thought, you know, I was blaming it on morning shifts and saying, ha, 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 these hours are, are killers. But it really wasn't that. It was, I was actually starving myself. I've actually said to people a couple of times when they ask me, how did you make such a change, you know, in your diet? And I say, well, I ate myself thin. And I don't mean to be facetious when I say that, but I'm, I'm eating more now than I ever ate during that so period. When it's when, when done properly. So yeah. as you were, say, making your way towards 19, 20 stone, all that kind of thing, maybe yeah. into 21 stone, did you kind of pretend it wasn't happening? Were you in denial? Or, I mean, did you conceal your eating? Were you... I'd love to be able to say that I didn't, but I'd be lying. Um, I did conceal my eating. I got very embarrassed to be seen eating, and I, and I don't mean eating Mars bars or, or, or that sort of thing, but I mean even just eating an ordinary meal, out with friends, having dinner. Um, I was convinced or I felt very emotionally insecure about being seen eating because I was aware that people's perception of me was that of a fat person. And I think people think that people who have a problem with overweight have a love affair with food. And I think really in a lot of cases, and certainly in my experience, I had a hate affair with food because I ate and I got fatter, but I had to eat to live. And every time I put something into my mouth, I was conscious of the fact that I wasn't helping myself. And I, I just, I didn't know where to go. And I got to that, that weight of 23 stone and all the difficulties that came with it. Yeah. And I still was glamorous. I loved my hair and makeup and nails. And um, I certainly made an effort about my personal appearance. And, uh, and I was still quite an upbeat person, but I would yeah. be lying if I said that I wasn't aware when I looked in the mirror that there was a sad person looking back at me. I was saying that about, you know, chairs would collapse and get yeah. airport. It, it, was it that bad? Yeah, it really was. Really? Um, when it got to the stage when I went to, to airports and I love traveling and I love yeah, holidaying. Sure. 
Um, it got to the stage where I had to have one of the little motorised trucks that they bring elderly people and disabled people around in. And, oh, I'm sorry for getting emotional, but yeah, it's, mm. it, it was very tough, and it's tough for me to look back yeah. because it's so recent. Um, and I couldn't, I couldn't walk to the, to the plane. I had to be brought on a motorised vehicle to the plane. When I got there, I couldn't fit the belt around me. And the first time that happened, I've never had children, so I didn't realise that, you know, that they have extension belts for, for pregnant ladies. Mm -hmm. um, and the first time that I couldn't get the belt to close, I thought they were going to take me off the flight. And the attendant was saying, you have to close your seatbelt, you have to close your seatbelt. I was thinking, what do I say now? Yeah. And I eventually got the courage to just say, can't do it, yeah. And then she was wonderful, and she just said, oh, it's okay. And she came back with an extension belt. So I didn't even realize that that facility existed. But then the, the food tray, I couldn't pull that down because my belly was literally too large to allow the tray to drop. So ironically, on a long flight, I wouldn't eat. <laughs> yeah, because, because of circumstance. Couldn't balance, What happened yeah. to your couch at home? Oh, man. There's probably somebody in an office somewhere in, in I think they, it came originally from Northern Ireland, and I hope they're not <laughs> looking tonight. Um, I bought a really expensive, beautiful couch, and I still have it. Uh, and it was back in the days when it was, you know, possible to buy a really <laughs> expensive couch. Yeah, yeah. Um, but mine broke. Um, so it was within the warranty, and I, I it called broke up. By you. It I sat on it, and it collapsed. It had a wooden frame, and it just literally fell apart. So um, do you I remember? Said, do you, uh, let's let's talk okay. about that. But, <laughs> no, but I don't. I, but do you remember sitting on that couch mm. and, and feeling it collapse beneath you? Yeah, that well, must have been a pretty horrible moment. Well, I, I'll tell you. In fairness, when it collapsed, I said that's really badly made. It's the couch's fault. Totally. And I rang the repairmen and they came down and they fixed it. And I was pleased and I said, well, there you go. You asserted your rights, a good consumer. Only then it broke again. You're thinking there must be the shoddiest couch company in, <laughs> in the world. I'm afraid at that stage reality was biting through. So yeah. I rang the repair company again and got them to come. But I got somebody else to go and answer the door because I was afraid if they saw me and my size and the fact it was their second trip down to, uh, to fix the couch that they'd... They'd actually say, well... So, so when you were, for example, going to work, did you work on the ground floor or upstairs somewhere? Uh, I worked um, on the top floor of the malt house. Is that a big, is that a Canal tall Key. building? Yes, it's eight so, flights of stairs. Or was there a lift? Or there what was did, a lift. So you got the lift, I presume, did you? I did. And were you mobile? I, mean, I mentioned in the mm. introduction, like, was that an issue for you? Well, you drove to work, I presume. I drove to work in um, a red two-seater convertible, which um, was completely impractical for, for me and the fact that I had a sore back. And, yeah. uh, it was, but I was not giving up my convertible. It's 21 years old and I still have her. Okay. Uh, but anyhow, I would drive to work, I would drag myself out. Now, outside Outside of work, I used a walking stick. Did you? But I didn't let anybody in work see that I had a walking stick. And I, I don't know why. I, I don't know then, and I tried, to, you know, analysing it. And in the book, I look at it as well. I don't know why, for me, it felt worse um, to appear disabled than to appear... I don't know. I just... I felt it was a weakness to show them that I couldn't yeah. manage without a stick. So I would make my way up to the desk. And even though there was a lift in the building, um, the coffee was on the, the facilities were on the third floor. Mm -hmm. And um, I parked my car outside. Um, and this is important because I never made coffee for anybody else in the building. They all made coffee for me. I'm sorry, guys. Yeah. It wasn't that I wasn't being generous about the coffee making, but it was such a trial for me that I would accept the coffee round from everybody else, but I was never the one making it because yeah. carrying the tray was, was too much for me. And also, I really think, and I'm sure that the clamping guys can probably pull records to prove it, but I think I was the most clamped person in the city of Dublin yeah. because I couldn't make it down the stairs to put money into the car when the time was up. So, so just, I would sit there, and it was a bit of a, a lucky dip to see how many times I get clamped. Did anyone who loves you ever say, Tina, you know, it's getting a bit out of control now? Did anyone ever sit you down, or, was it, or, or did people love you too much to want to say it to you? I don't think... That, do you know, it's a really difficult question, because yeah. I genuinely don't think that anybody who was really close to me did actually be able to I don't think I just even think within a family I'm thinking my own family like, yeah. what, obviously I think one of my brothers world, actually probably. did now come to think of it in fairness and you I I didn't appreciate it ah. yeah I don't think I appreciated it and I remember a friend of mine um, having a go at me and I remember thinking that's incredibly impolite and now one one woman's having a go is another helping a friend 
What was she doing? Oh, she was helping a friend, looking at it now from, from my but eyes. But you on thought this she side was of... being a bitch or something like that? Well, I didn't want to hear it, and I wasn't ready to hear it. And I think that's probably one of the things that makes the difference between losing weight yeah. and thinking about losing weight. You have to be ready to do it yourself. So when were you ready? What was, was, uh, it, was it a eureka moment, or was. was it a gradual? No, it was a it eureka. Was it? Oh, yeah. Which was that? I got terribly sick. I okay. had a problem with my gallbladder. It turned out to be very badly diseased, and I ended up in hospital seriously ill. Drips the works drama yeah. and um, it took a long time for them to stabilize my body I had lots of toxins mm -hmm. in it and finally they, they got me ready to discharge and they said your gallbladder has to come out you need vital surgery it, you can survive without a gallbladder but you you have to tackle this and I said yeah okay well we'll do that and they said we can't yeah and uh, the consultant at the time explained to me um, he said you we can't risk putting you under a, a general anesthetic for a major open surgery yeah. because your heart probably won't take it with your weight. And he says, we can't do keyhole surgery. And the way he put it to me was, we don't have instruments long enough to push through your fat. And that hit me like a punch in, 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 the, in the heart. And on top of that, he told me I had a fatty liver. He told me about the cholesterol problems that I had. And I suddenly realized all of the time that I had worried about my weight, and I did worry, and I tried fads and things along the 10 years of, of getting to 23 stone, but all during that time, I had thought of it as being a cosmetic problem. And I, I didn't realize, I, I, that's probably denial, because I'm a reasonably intelligent female, um, but I didn't realize, at some level, I didn't realize that I was really harming my health mm. and shortening my life, and that's one of the one of the things I try to you know, put through in, in the book as well, it's not just about looking pretty, it's about having a wonderful, full life and being able to take as much as you can. Healthy mind, this. healthy body, all that sort oh, of thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. But anyhow, when he said this to me, I, I, I said to myself, um, if I had just been told that I had cancer, pretty difficult verdict to be getting. Yeah. And it's on one side of my family. If I had been told that I had heart disease, and given my weight, it was a likelihood, and there's also heart disease in my family. Okay. Again, fairly limited options. This man was saying to me, you can live a healthy life, we can help you to repair yourself, but you are overweight and we can't do it. Now, that's a pretty that begins, clear... Uh, and you, that begins your process, then. You say, right, I'm, I'm going to sort this out. Yeah, I'm going to pick myself up now and get back in the race, as the song says. Well, which... for the first time, I didn't say, I'm going to try and lose weight. What I said, say? I'm losing weight. How much weight did you lose in the year? 10 stone in a year and 12 stone overall. Well, it's not bad going, is it? Yeah. Thank you. That's huge. Excuse me. Um, I never thought that that was possible, though, and, and I mean, I think that's one of the reasons as well why yeah. I didn't try to, to diet earlier, because when I, when I got to that stage of being 23 stone, yeah. and again, it was cosmetic, I was saying to myself, it will take years to lose that so amount of weight. So you needed to psychologically cross the Rubicon, too? Oh, yeah, and I thought my skin was going to be, you know, a, a problem, and, yeah. uh, and I want, again, I want ladies or gentlemen to know that you can lose it, and you, you know... My skin is not perfect, but I'm okay. I get my legs and my arms out when I'm out on the hills running around the place, and yeah. uh, I'm quite happy. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with my body. What was the key, do you think, uh, move food-wise for you in that year? What was the key, moment, the key thing to Well, to I do? went off to France for... When, when I got this verdict, I said, right, I need to get away, and, and I need to concentrate on me for a while. Yeah. I need to get my head in order. I need to figure out the rest of my life mm -hmm. and start living. Uh, and I went off to France, and I joked to my friends that I went on the, um, the red wine and olive diet. Okay. Uh, because I ate fish, and I snacked on olives, and I bought a really expensive bottle of wine, and I could only afford to drink one glass of it a night. So um, that lasted for a week. I went back. I'd actually lost a good bit of weight in that one week, but I knew it wasn't sustainable. I, I spent another couple of weeks, you know, sort of... Um, totally limiting what I was eating and being hungry all the time. And I knew, look, you, you've got to get some help and support. Sure. Now, I went to Weight Watchers, and there are lots of different places yeah. that you can go and, and supports that you can have. But I went to Weight Watchers, and I went to the first meeting, and I listened. And I thought, it's all sensible. It's mm. not about good foods or bad foods. It's about proportion sure. and, you know, what you put on your plate. And um, I would have had the salad as a garnish. Mm. Uh, and as, as, as opposed, opposed to, to the other way around. Yes, yeah. uh, and I, I said afterwards to our leader, Vera Baker, who, wonderful lady, but I said to her afterwards, um, 
I can do the diet, but I won't do the walking. Yeah. Now, that's changed a bit. Well, at what point, uh, when you're in the middle of all that, Tina, do you think, do you know what I'm going to do now? I'm going to climb Mount Everest. I mean, when, when, what sort of, is, is, is that a pub talk? or? Well, to me, it's actually quite a spiritual moment, to be oh, quite really? honest okay, with well, you. Fair enough. Um, I had lost about... I'd lost, I'd, I'd lost about four stone, and I'd had my operation, and I think I might have lost another stone or two after that. And um, I was talking to my friends on Facebook, because I got enormous support yes. from Facebook, because I set up a page and started documenting my weight loss. And um, it, was, it was my conscience, because I would come home from, from Weight Watchers and I'd put my post up and say how much weight I had lost, yes. or not, as the case may be. And I, I sort of... It gave me a bit of an impetus. So anyhow, this particular occasion I came home. Now, I was, generally speaking, in brilliant form at this stage because I'd had my operation, I'd lost a lot of weight. But on this particular day, I was a bit down because I had another six stone to lose. And I, yeah. I went and I said on Facebook, come on, you've got to motivate me now. I have another mountain to climb. And this wonderful lady called Rosaline um, got in touch with me from the Hope Foundation. She says, I have a mountain for you to climb if you're really interested in climbing mountains. Mm -hmm. And then she said, would you go to Everest Base Camp? Now, let me blind you with the science just for a moment and, sure. and sort of put it into context. Everest is this incredible, extraordinary, icy, killer, thriller heap of rock and ice, 29,000 feet higher than airplanes fly. Um, I was never talking about going to the summit. We were talking about base camp Mount Everest, which is... Um, oh, I could be wrong with the figures, but about 17,700 yeah. feet. Karen Tool, which is Ireland's yeah, highest yeah, yeah. mountain, is 3,000, so that'll give you an idea. So she said, would you come to Everest Base Camp? I said, without a moment of hesitation, I would love to. And then I thought, can I? can I? And I said, let me make two phone calls. And I rang my consultant, and I asked him, is it physically possible yeah. for me to do this? And I rang Pat Falvey. Oh, yes, of course. Extraordinary mountaineer. mountaineer yeah. And he was the man who was actually leading this particular expedition to Great. base camp. And I said to him, oh, I'm going to do a cork accent now, and he's going to kill me. Try it, I can't. try it. I said to him, can I do this? And I explained, you know, that I'd lost so much weight, and uh, I had been going to the gym at this stage. And uh, he said, well, he said... All of the things that you've done are probably the reason why you won't make it to base camp. And that kind of took yeah, me back a bit. That. And it wasn't yeah. quite the response I was expecting. And I said, well, why? And he said, when your legs are screaming and your heart is roaring and your lungs are calling, he said, you'll say to yourself, I've done a lot. I've done enough. So I thought about that for a moment. And then I said, I told you it was a terrible cork acid, by the way. Sorry, cork. Do. Um, so I thought about it for a moment and I said, are you telling me that if my head is in the right place, my body will follow? And he said, I suppose, I am, girl. And I said, book me a place. So that was the start of it. Well, uh, unfortunately, we, don't, we, we can't bring you to the top, but we can bring you back down and say, congratulations, you did make it to the top and people can read about well, it in your book. Well, to base camp and Calipatar and a little bit further than as that. As close as you can. Okay. But it's a great old story, I have to say, and uh, I think a lot of people watch will be going, yeah, I think I'd like to do something like that too, so well done. Well, I just want to say one very quick thing. To anybody out there who um, is where I was and thinks that you can't do anything, be, be it climb a mountain, jump in a lake, yeah. lose weight, start up a new business. If you want it, you can do it. And I went from not being able to walk hardly to being able to climb a mountain. And it's so worth trying it. Thank you. Well done. Thank you so much. Great stuff. Tina Gates book one spot in front of the other. It's out next week. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, Eileen. Hello. I'm laughing because I can hear you there behind me breathing. <laughs> Eileen McEntee, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. And where are you from? I'm from Baileyborough. In County Cavan? County Cavan. I'd say you'd love $10,000, would you? I would love it, yes. And would you like a trip to New York? Beautiful, oh, yes. And yes. who would you bring with you? I'll bring you, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pack my toothbrush. Uh, Eileen, thanks, thanks so much for that. Listen, we'll see you, see you in Dublin Airport, what, tomorrow? <laughs> uh, look after yourself. The good news is you won the whole kitten boodle. Well done, Eileen. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's it for tonight. Thanks to all my guests. Thanks to you at home for watching. We'll be back here next Friday for Eurosong 2012. That's right, we'll be deciding who's going to represent us at this year's Eurovision. In the meantime, I'll talk to you on 2FM on Monday morning at 9am. Looking forward to it. Until then, have a great weekend. Look after yourself. See you next time.
there's more chat and entertainment tomorrow night here on RT1 as Brendan O'Connor plays host to the stars of My Big Fat Gypsy Wedding, Chef Marco Pierre White and Brit Award winner Emily Sande. That's the Saturday Night Show at a quarter to ten tomorrow here on RT1.